Um, our next talk is by Jeremy Stott, hardware hacker from Auckland, or something along those lines, anyway. Over to you. Thanks very much, Hayden. Cool. So you guys are here to see Bluetooth Low Energy, I hope. Um, show of hands if anyone's used Bluetooth Low Energy before. Ooh. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> there was a couple. Of, and what about that classic Bluetooth? If there's a different, yeah, you got like your, your car, you like connect up your phone or something like that. Okay, cool. So you know, at least know what I mean when I say Bluetooth, and some of you have played with it, some of you know that it's everywhere already. Cool. Um, so a bit about me. Um, I've like an embedded systems background. Uh, most of my stuff is C and C++ um, on little so, uh, robots or electronics platforms. And I sort of say, oh, okay, Python by night, sometimes quite literally. Um, and then all morning, I guess. But I um, hope to keep that to a minimum by sort of weaseling in Python to my day job. So you'll find everywhere I go, there's a trail of Python scripts that are poorly written and terrible to maintain. Um, and actually, it was funny. There's a guy who used to work. Um, so I, I changed a few jobs. And he actually joined just as I left on a couple of occasions. And so he'll be seeing the commit messages of this Jeremy guy. And like, who is this? Who keeps writing this code? Uh, he didn't punch me when he met me, so I, I assume it was okay. Uh, yeah. And so I run the NZ Pug Auckland meetups. So if you're in Auckland and you wanted to um, come and you know, do, give a talk about Python or just come and enjoy some talks about Python, um, you can find me or you can find the meetup page. Um, we also have like a hands-on meetup as well where you can come and bring your laptops and do some stuff. Um, and currently I'm in marine electronics, so I'm building building electronics for big, big boats and millionaires, and that's quite odd, uh, but it's okay. So a bit of history about Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, so the classic Bluetooth has been around for a while, uh, but sort of Nokia in 2001, they were like, well, it's not really that good for our low power applications, and we could maybe do a bit better, and they started some research. Um, and then in about 2006, they released this thing called Webri. Well, that's what they branded it. And... Um, uh, that was that was sort of I don't I don't think many people knew about it I didn't even know about the name Webri until I researched this talk, uh, and so uh, a couple of years later, sort of Bluetooth 4.0 in 2010, they included this Webri and rebranded it I guess as Bluetooth 4.0, um, and still no one really had any devices or anything until the iPhone 4s, which was the first, uh, which is quite cool. They were first implement Bluetooth 4.0. And so shortly afterwards, everyone wanted to be smart ready. Uh, so there weren't many peripherals out yet, but everyone wanted to sell their device as sort of smart ready device. Uh, no one really knew what that meant, but I guess I, don't, I still don't know what that means. Sometimes my phone's not that smart. Um, and in 2013, that's when things started. Okay, spec got updated a little bit. We got 4.1. We got lots more devices now on the market, um, and. Uh, everyone's writing these peripherals. Now the reason why it's quite awesome compared to the previous Bluetooth Classic, uh, especially for Apple hardware, is if you're developing classic Bluetooth, you actually needed to include a bit of Apple hardware in your product to sort of say that and, and be part of their developer you know, ecosystem um, to say, oh yes, this is, a, this is an authorized peripheral, an authorized device. Uh, but you didn't have to do that for low energy. Uh, it was kind of impractical and I don't think anyone liked it anyway. Uh, so there were so, lots and lots of peripherals that were suddenly compatible with Apple devices, and there was so many Apple, so much Apple hardware out there. That's quite, uh, quite an awesome opportunity if you were going to create a little fitness tracker or something. You suddenly have access to all these people with all these smartphones. And then 4.2 came along, uh, which uh, did some security updates and some IPv6 stuff, so you could, your your peripheral could potentially talk through your phone to the internet. Um, I haven't seen many of those devices around, but. Uh, it's the specs there, and then data length was it was extended a bit. And the reason that was done is it, it's really low, really low power, but the data rate is actually also very low. And so I'll show, I'll get to that in a minute. So they they kind of improved a little bit um, to make it a bit faster. So you but you've got to trade off something. And if maybe in 2017 we'll see Bluetooth 5.0, uh, Internet of Things. I don't know if that's Still a buzzword in 2000. Will be a buzzword in 2017. It's kind of clobbered to death now, but they'll uh, they've got things 
related in, in the mesh sense that you don't necessarily need a phone or a tablet to talk to these peripherals. They can kind of talk amongst themselves and then when a phone comes in range they could all sort of kind of figure, it, figure itself out. Uh, now I don't know if, if you've seen a bunch of different names for blue flow energy. Like there's been a couple. There's been, well, Weebri, which I didn't know about. Logo looked quite good too. Uh, 4.0, you, you see like low energy. You've got Bluetooth Smart, which is the latest one. I love this. I actually found this on a page. It's a compatibility chart of these different logos in case you get confused. Uh, smart Ready, compatible with Smart Ready, obviously, and then Bluetooth with no text, and then Bluetooth Smart. That's great. Uh, Bluetooth compatible with Smart Ready. Well, we already knew that, but just in case we didn't look that line, so we know that one. And it's also compatible with itself as well. We know that. Bluetooth Smart, that's compatible with Smart Ready. I think that's like a recursive thing now. Uh, no, no, it's okay. We're okay. We've got, we're all good. So it, suffice to say, these are all the same thing. Uh, most people just say BLE, um, but that was never one of their official names. And they had ultra low power to start with, like Bluetooth ultra low power. But anyway, uh, you'll see, if you're going to search for this stuff, search for BLE uh, or um, Bluetooth 4.0, even though you're going to be using the 4.2 spec. Yeah. So what is this Bluetooth low energy uh, in a wireless sense? Um, if, you can, if you can sort of suspend your disbelief of uh, graphs and how that maps to wireless stuff, uh, you've got like frequency increasing along this axis and this might be how, how loud the signal is. And the Bluetooth low energy sits between 2.4 gigahertz, so similar in the same band as Wi-Fi, to 2.4835. And so each of, these, each of these little spikes is a channel that your Bluetooth device can talk on. So they, they kind of reserve these, these bits, and then so they know that those are the frequencies that everyone's going to be listening on. Um, kind of like uh, um, back in... Uh, the 19th century, where they were, they had this, you know, that was an awesome talk, wasn't it? Uh, so th these are these are those kind of bands of frequencies. Now, you've got three advertising channels which are kind of reserved for telling everyone that your device is in the in the room, um, and then you've got the rest of data channels. And these are sort of like the areas where you'd see a Wi-Fi channel overlap. None of this is to scale or anything. Not like I don't know if anyone's got a photographic memory. Uh, but, oh, this is going to be recorded. So oh dear. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's not to scale, it's kind of just like, okay, this is a general idea. And what happens uh, when you're transferring data across these airwaves, these wireless spikes, is, is this frequency hopping thing. Now, the classic Bluetooth also did frequency hopping, if you knew that, but it's a much more complicated uh, scheme. This one was very simple. It just hopped to the next frequency based on like a predetermined uh, sequence. So it knew the sequence, it can generate a new, the new frequency number and if the uh, phone and the peripheral both know the same sequence, the jump, they can kind of jump at, at the same time. You know, you don't have to go to the new one and go, oh, are you here yet? You know, they, they just know. That's sort of like synchronized. Um, so that's a linear feedback shift register kind of scheme if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but it basically is like a, it's like a random number, but one that you can predict. Uh, yeah. Randomly predictable. So there's some technical stuff here. Uh, don't worry about too much of it. Maybe you can pause. It. Okay, that was it for your recording. If you were going <laughs> to, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, a lot of the questions I get asked about Bluetooth Low Energy is what's the range like, um, and it sort of really depends. With a lot of like wireless stuff, that's what everyone's going to say. It depends. Practically, so I, I worked on a, a startup where we did some Bluetooth Low Energy uh, wearable devices, and so it's like on your body, your body's interfering with everything and you've got room, you've got other devices, you've, you're, you're in the train station, whatever. So really practically you'd only be looking at about 10 meters. If you're further than 10 meters you're going to get a lot of packet loss unless you're just sending like a single thing over and over again, uh, you're going to have a bad time. You might get it further if it's line of sight, you know, cloudy, no, no clouds and this, the planets have aligned and everything, but about 10 meters, don't do more than that. Uh, but it's much slower. So you've got the data rate, the active throughput, um, Way slower, point, you know, point 0.27 megabits per second. Uh, and actually, you're sort of like the actual, again, this number lies, and you think, oh, that's okay, I only need 27 kilobits per second, 2700, uh, 270 kilobits per second. Um, but sort of the actual data rate that you're going to see, you know, Dutch, like pushing data through this protocol, is going to be about 5 kilobytes per second. 
Uh, so if you're, if you're thinking, oh, I've got this new idea where I'm going to stream audio through Bluetooth Low Energy, it just remembers five kilobytes per second. So it's not very much. And you're going to lose a lot of that data as well. Um, <laughs> so, so active slaves, um, you, you can't, there's no number um, sort of defined in the spec, but this depends on each device. We found like Apple hardware would do about eight to ten. Um, and Android, I, I can't remember which device I use, but around it's like a 10 mark. And, um, but if you're transferring that, if you're trying to get five kilobytes per second on all those you know, eight channels, you can forget that. So it's actually uh, only about four channels. We've still got about five kilobytes per second on four connected devices. So that gives you an idea about it. And a peak power, so power consumption, it's like, why would you want this, right? This is, sounds terrible, uh, is way down. So we're, we're using, these things last for years. On, on batteries, coin cell batteries. So that's why we've done, that's why they did this. You can still use classic Bluetooth, by the way. It's not as if it's superseded or anything. It's just, it's just one of the implementations, like a sub-spec. So <coughs> there's a whole bunch of devices, and you may have been use, you know, using Bluetooth without knowing it. Like if you've got a smartwatch, if you've got a Fitbit, um, if you've uh, paired, with, if, you've, if you've found a beacon in the shopping mall, or not even known about your phone looking for beacons, uh, there's skateboards, there's uh, sense networks, all, a whole bunch of devices. I think mainly because this sort of explosion of hardware that has for, uh, Bluetooth 4.0 capability, because um, it's the same uh, frequency as the classic Bluetooth, so it didn't have to do much to uh, also include Bluetooth 4.0. This guy here is, is like a little, if you've seen Star Wars, there's like a, the, new, the latest Star Wars has a little robot that runs around uh, and so there, there's a, a neat little Bluetooth-enabled robot. And so you can use your phone or your tablet to run this around the room. It's quite fun. Uh, it scares the crap out of your dog. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't my dog, it was my parents' dog, so that was okay. <laughs> um, maybe you'll never come back to my house again. <laughs> um, so I didn't break mine open. No, I, that's, mine's still here, but um, these guys on the tested YouTube channel, um, Adam Savage and a bunch of other clever guys, um, do some interesting stuff, they break things apart, look at how things work. It's a really cool YouTube channel. So they broke theirs apart and, and figured out how it works. So if you're interested, go and have a look at that. So how do you connect to these devices? You've got your, your central node, which is probably usually going to be a phone. You can use laptop, you can use your, your tablet. You can use another device that can behave as a central or a peripheral. Um, and it's going to connect to a bunch. So it's this star kind of network where one peripheral can't talk to another peripheral. Uh, and so you can have this limited number of connections. Now, this is what will change in that mesh network where, where one peripheral could potentially talk to another peripheral without going through a central node. Um, so that, that's actually a really good, I don't even know if you'll be able to see this on the recording. Maybe I could make these available somehow. Um, it's a good um, guide, like Adafruit had a really good sort of uh, Bluetooth low energy description if you wanted to go through this. Again, my incredibly two scale, you know, accurate representation of how this is happening. Uh, you kind of have these connection intervals which are set by the phone, and then the, the peripheral has a chance to send some data every connection interval. Um, so it kind of like wakes up, listens for a bit, it's like, is anything happening? Nothing's happening, go back to sleep. And then the next connection interval, wake up, oh, I've got, you know, I've got been asked for some data, here's the data, do you want some more data? No, nope. okay, let's go back to sleep. So that's really how it's really, really low power is you're only, it's only waking up for this sort of short amount of time. And you can imagine if this connection interval is quite long, which is typically about 30 milliseconds, which is very, very long in, in, in you know, processor time. It's, it's great for a processor. Um, they, they're only using power a very short amount of time. But it also means you can't get much data through the, through the um, network. So <coughs> the way that the standard works and I've deliberately made it a bit cryptic uh, because uh, I don't, don't expect you to understand any of it. Is, but you, but main, the main point is that they define some services that you can then use. So if you were implementing a, a Fitbit clone, you could then create one that had the heart rate service. Uh, and then so it's got that ID and you need to implement a bunch of characteristics. And you say, I've got a heart rate measurement, I've got a location on my body, uh, maybe that one's an optional characteristic. So you can see the standards like built up like that. They say these are read-write, these are optional, these are um, 
notify. So we've got one that's a notify characteristic. That means that the peripheral can just send you data without you having to ask for it. So it's kind of like a subscribe, and then it's like a callback function, essentially, um, that you get this data back to your, to your device. If you were going to stream a lot of data quickly, that's how you do it. You use a notify um, uh, thing, and you just, whenever you woke up, you would just send, 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 and you go back to sleep. And then you get the next connection tool, and you send, 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 send. So that's probably like the only way you can stream data quite quickly. <coughs> and here's a custom service that you, 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 know, you can do, you, you just have to create a 128-bit ID instead of 16-bit. And it's recommended that you just generate a random UUID number, um, like from a UUID, there's a, there's a couple of websites that will generate this for you. And um, it, you just use it. And so it's kind of like a free-for-all of characteristics and, and things like that. So it's, it's manufacturer-specific, you can do whatever you want with it, you can create as many characteristics as you want with it. Um, Chance of a collision is astronomically slow, uh, astronomically low, so it's, I guess that's pretty good. Uh, but it doesn't stop someone from reading your your characteristics. So if someone buys your device, and you've put some custom secret secret squirrel profile on there, uh, they can still read it and interrogate it. And what happens when I write one to this field? And, and so it's not it's not pretending to be uh, you know secure in any way. So. <coughs> That's enough about, uh, okay, low-level Bluetooth stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm using Python. Well, I have to be because I'm at a Python conference, right? Uh, no, I, like to, I love to use Python, uh, and I want to do my Bluetooth low-energy stuff. Let's get going. So Py, you know, go to PyPy, Bluetooth low-energy. It's quite surprised to actually see the fit on one page. Uh, I don't know if it's because I searched for like Bluetooth low-energy and whether that's like a... I tried BLE, but then that matched a whole bunch of stuff, like um, Noble, you know, <laughs> Um, so, all right, let's look at some of these. Um, you know, Bleep, that one looks all right. Uh, low energy BLE library for Python, awesome. Um, currently only supports Linux, experimental support for OS X. Oh, I don't really like that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to do this for a window. Like, if I'm doing this commercially, you know, my most of my clients will be using Windows. So that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. Even as a developer of experimental support, that sounds like a lot of work, so I don't like that one. Um, BluePy, it's another good one, uh, <coughs> using, using BlueZ. I don't know if any of you have sort of known about BlueZ, but that's kind of like a Linux-only tool. But even if you didn't know that, you kind of like go to, like, oh, yes, I'm getting excited, go to the GitHub page, and it's like, oh, I've only tested this on Linux, mostly developed with the Raspberry Pi, uh, should also run on x86 Debian. It's like, ah, oh. okay, that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of a bother. That's not really going to help me either. Uh, I'm running a Mac. Um, what am I going to do? So no Windows support. Uh, this has been a b big sort of thorn, I guess, in Bluetooth Low Energy's side. So this is like a landscape of what uh, the support, and I've just picked some random ones, so it's not actually sort of complete or anything. Uh, so you've got some hotspots over there. You've got Linux, you know, it's right in the middle. It's got everything, you know, it's got JavaScript, BlueZ, Go, Python, that's awesome, right? Um, you've got OS X. Yeah, there's still some Python, there's some Go. No BlueZ now, although it's sort of maybe possible one day. Uh, according to a mailing list, but let's just say no BlueZ, uh, and you can also use their libraries. So they pr they provide some very good Bluetooth low energy libraries. And then you move over to like the app world, and you've got okay JavaScript or or Swift or Objective C, or then the Android API or JavaScript. And so these native APIs are actually very good. They're very well thought out and they work very well. Uh, but I want to use Python, right? This is, this is, and Windows is like down there somewhere. I'm uh, pretty sure it's off screen. You know. <laughs> uh, so really, you can kind of draw this, you can extend this out a bit, because it's not really true that you can't run Python on iOS and Android and use Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, there are a few ways to do that. Uh, Kivi is a good example if you've um, seen that it's like a cross-platform uh, GUI library. But their support for Bluetooth Low Energy was, was at least was a bit of a stretch. Um, there was like a, a, a gist that I saw was created three years ago, an example of using Android and Python with pajamas. Uh, <laughs> I think that might have been like a previous pajamas thing, and then it's now this. I don't know. So that's what they were. I think they were using that for Kivi. Uh, if not, I, I, I apologize. But yeah, so this was there was a, there was a sort of a page on some guy saying it actually works. Um, so so that's that's tenable. Um, but there's this thing called, so you saw this big 
JavaScript bubble, um, which everyone's, you know, everyone's JavaScript, uh, uh, sort of that birth and death of JavaScript talk uh, by, um, oh, Brett Victor? No. Uh, that may be coming true. If you, if you know the reference, um, you can look it up. I can, might put a description up somehow. Uh, but JavaScript's taking over, right? Um, how, how, is this, how is this including all these platforms? And the really crazy thing is web Bluetooth. So as the name kind of implies, uh, it's Bluetooth on the web. Uh, so we'll do a quick demo um, if it's going to work. Uh, so it's a standard. It's not a W3, W3C standard or like part of their standards track. But it is a standard um, that's quite recent and has been adopted already by some of the browsers, like Chrome uh, had support since some version. And um, so I grabbed a nightly version of Chrome. Um, and you have to enable it. Uh, you have to enable this thing by uh, going to your flags, Chrome flags, and then enable web Bluetooth. So it's by default still not on. Um, but it's there if you wanted to play with it. Um, so this is really cool. Windows is actually there. And I, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work on, on Windows um, yet, but I, I haven't tried it. But this looks really promising. Uh, what is this? This is a bit scary as well. Um, so let's, let's have a play. We've got this, this BB-8 droid, uh, which is this guy. And um, someone's already written this, this little app to, using web Bluetooth, connect to this guy. So what happens when you, when you try and connect? So it kind of pops up this thing. This is what part of the standard that you had to tell the user that something was going to happen, that they were uh, going to be scanning. I guess it's scanned without my, uh, without my accepting, but at least it doesn't report those results back to the page yet. Uh, so I can find all of my BB-8 droids. I only have one. Uh, and then you, can, then you can pair with that. And, and now we've actually got a connection to my physical device from the web browser. Uh, which is kind of kind of crazy. Another interesting thing was they were saying um, should also only work. Uh, where's our wow, spec? Um, somewhere they mentioned it should only work under HTTPS and um, like many of the other the other APIs that they're working on, um, and and through a, and it works over through a web server, not a, not opening a file locally. But it seemed to work okay for me. So maybe it's still in its early stages. I don't know. Uh, so we got this guy. And you're not going to be able to see this very well. Maybe I can put it over here and just hope that I don't drive off the edge. Can everyone see the little guy? OK, so. So I haven't installed anything to do this other than Chrome. Oh. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen too. Oh, no, his head. <laughs> Thank you. So it's really good. This guy, if you look at that, if you watch that tested video, you'll find out that the shell is actually about uh, almost a centimeter thick. And they had, had a real trouble getting it open. So they were like saying it's actually really good from, a, from falling off things point of view. So that's, uh, so that's enough of that. Let's, let's, let's disconnect this guy. Oh, the other interesting thing is you can see like a little Bluetooth -like booth logo in your bar, like the, like the volume icon would be in your Chrome tab. So that's kind of cool that, they would, that, that you know at least which tab is doing the uh, stealing your droid from your your desk. Um, so, <coughs> so we can kind of do this do this thing here, right, and include Windows in our JavaScript world uh, if we're using Chrome and Web Bluetooth. Uh, <laughs> but it still doesn't solve. I'm still using Python. I don't want to use JavaScript, right? Uh, uh, maybe another day, maybe a different conference. Um, so, what can I do to get uh, Windows going with with JavaScript at least, uh, and then maybe Python as we'll see. Uh, this was like the installation for um, uh, one of the JavaScript Node.js libraries for uh, sort of Windows, and uh, it sort of got to a point where it's like install Visual Studio, and I'm like, oh no no no, back out back out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but there is there is another option which is like Transcript. Um, so is, have any of you heard of Transcript? It's a really interesting, funny website, but it works really interestingly well. It sort of transpiles, doesn't compile, it transpiles JavaScript to Python. Well, sorry, Python to JavaScript. 
Um, so you write your Python source, and it generates JavaScript source. Um, so you can then use the Web Bluetooth API, uh, but in a Pythonic way. And apparently, it works really, really well. Um, I, I tried it out, and it did work. Um, I didn't have time to actually go and create a demo with the Web Bluetooth enabled stuff, but this was one of the ways, and I thought that was quite cool. Uh, with Web Bluetooth becoming a bit more popular and common, maybe this would be quite an interesting way. You could also use um, uh, PyPyJS, which is like the, the JavaScript uh, implementation of Python in, in the browser. There's various ways you can do this, uh, but they all get a bit messy, really. So uh, the last way you can maybe get this working on Linux is to write your own driver for some custom hardware. So what, what manufacturers will typically do is like Fitbit, they'll actually ship you a dongle as well. Um, and they've got some Bluetooth hardware on here, and they can just talk USB to the, the Bluetooth hardware, and then they don't have to implement um, Bluetooth natively. And the reason that this is so difficult is Windows uh, didn't include default drivers for Bluetooth Low Energy before Windows 8. So it's Windows 8 only when they said, hey, here's, some, here's a generic way to access Bluetooth Low Energy hardware. Um, so it was, it, that's why it was a problem. So you had to have like a manu manufacturer-specific driver, uh, which didn't really help the user out-of-the-box experience. Uh, so we can kind of draw this link, <laughs> I guess. It's very sort of tenable Python uh, using Bluetooth Low Energy on Windows. All right. Uh, but actually, a much easier way is to go with a Raspberry Pi. So I'm like, oh, well, if I'm going to buy a dongle anyway, um, why not buy quite a powerful dongle? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you can just buy them at PB Tech these days, which is awesome. Um, so you, you can, it's quite accessible. Um, and so you can plug that in, and you can talk to it over um, SSH. And all of, your, all of these examples that are out there for Linux and stuff work very, very easily, um, which is awesome. I was after that easy, easy, to, easy to work. Now, I can't quite ship a Raspberry Pi to each of my customers. They might sort of catch on and, and you know, all want one of these products <laughs> and then throw my Bluetooth bit away and then just keep the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's how I was playing around with the development in Python. So let's do a bit of a demo. Um, so we've got a, a camera set up here so that you don't have to look down here. You can look up there. Um, and this is, this is my Raspberry Pi running. Uh, and it is connected to my laptop via the Ethernet, Ethernet cable. And then I've got a screen here just so that I can remotely debug stuff if I actually have to, but it's not part of the talk. So the, the main thing is the Raspberry Pi is just acting as this giant dongle, and we're going to talk, talk to some of these interesting modules here. Um, so this one here is like a, like a beacon-style device. Um, you, you can see that another one in the background here is more of a... Um, like a development platform if you're going to build one of these modules. Um, and then you've even got some sort of like, like this one here, which is actually an Arduino connected to a Bluetooth module. So it, it can be actually really easy to write your own peripherals. Um, the Arduino one is one of my favorites because you can just plug it in and within about four or five lines of code, get going. Uh, so even as like a quite experienced, I guess, um, embedded system engineer, I still love to pick up those tools that make things super easy. Because um, I don't want to borrow about like, Installing a tool chain to get this thing working. I just wanted to, you know, make some lights go. Like, that's not that shouldn't be hard. Uh, so yeah, there's some really interesting um, devices you can talk to. So here I am on my Raspberry Pi. Uh, let's let's just make sure. There we are. Okay, some Raspberry Pi running an ARM. Cool. And there's there's various tools you can install if you followed that guide that was up on the screen. Um, you can get your Blue Z tools, which includes uh, ACI, uh, HCI tool, and then LE scan. And before I do this, this is going to scan all the Bluetooth devices in the room. <laughs> so I won't necessarily connect to your device. But if you don't want your device scanned, right, now would be the time to turn it off. Uh, all right. Didn't really give you enough time to turn it off, but here we go. <laughs> so these, these are now appearing. You've got, your, you've got an address, and then you've got a name if it can figure it out. Um, uh, so hopefully none of you have set the name on your Bluetooth device to be an interesting name. Digital Shield. Oh, nice. Um, one. Okay. we to stop this before this goes too bad. Um, but there's some interesting devices here, like this BB-8. That's our, that's our BB-8 droid. He's always sending, hey, come and play with me. Um, 
We've got the MetaWare device, which is, which is this, that round one you can see. And then we've got some other ones, which are various things in the room. So what can you do other than just scanning? You want to actually do some interesting scanning. This might not give you enough information. You want to know a bit more about these devices. So that's where you might use um, a product called uh, Ubertooth. So this, this is a gadget by um, Great Scott Gadgets. And um, so I'll just give you the name Great Scott Gadgets. And it's the, um, I shouldn't do that, Ubertooth One. And what it lets you do is kind of do some really, uh, really clever Bluetooth stuff from your laptop. So this is kind of like the ultimate dongle, if you will. Um, it's open source and open hardware, so you could build your own. Um, otherwise, it costs you about $100. It's definitely not necessary if you wanted to get playing with Bluetooth ONG, um, but it, you can start doing some really interesting stuff with this one. So uh, what we do is we do an Ubertooth uh, BTLE and some argument that doesn't mean anything. So it's, it's scanning now. It's doing the same thing that you saw before, um, except all the time. And you're getting all sorts, of, all sorts of values. And you're getting the signal strength of every device that's talking to this. And then you're getting all the data that it's reporting as well. So um, did anyone see the BB-8 go past? <laughs> that's right. We, we'll do something a bit better. Uh, we'll, we can um, pipe this to a named pipe. So you can do a MK FIFO temp pipe um, and that will create your named pipe and then you can do ubertooth uh, btle diff c and then the name of that pipe uh, that shouldn't happen definitely Okay, so it's now waiting actually. It's not going to send any data until I open the other end of that pipe, which we can do in Wireshark. So the way you do this is you go into your capture settings and you go into your manage interfaces and pipes. And you just find this up on the internet and follow this instructions, right? And you create the named pipe here. So you just add that, that in so that you can then, in your capture interfaces, you can see the named pipe as one of the inputs. And then we can start capturing capturing stuff. No interface selected. Okay. Start. So now it's going. And if we if we just scoot over, so now we can see that it's doing what it was before. But now it's actually a much much more readable format for us because we can, while it's going, we can have a look and see what else is happening. Like this one, for example, is a scan request. So it's, there's not only advertisements going on. There's other stuff. This is. One of your devices has now asked to scan the room for other devices. Um, so you can see what it is and which device it is, and you can look at the data in there. And so that would be the source address and the scanning address, what it's asking for. So we should be able to see our BB-8 in here. Um, I there are a lot of devices. So I cheated because I know the name of the address off by heart now because I had to try this the other day. But you wouldn't normally know, I guess, that it was C90DECE, whatever. Uh, oh, no, I lied. This is the, this is the middleware. Uh, but anyway, let's look at that one because that's also interesting. Um, so we can see this, the, this is that custom UID that I mentioned before. So they're implementing a custom profile. And you can see what profile it is. If they implemented other profiles, you could see those as well. It's kind of like optional to advertise these, but some people do. Uh, and there's some other interesting stuff about it, uh, the names and the signal strength and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's Wireshark. With the Ubertooth, you can do a lot more. You can actually um, follow active connections. Um, so you can kind of like, after you've connected to it and you're sending data, you can grab those transactions as well and have a look down and see what went where and at what time. Uh, it is a bit fiddly, though, so it sometimes doesn't work very well. Uh, you can see here I've got some malformed packets. Uh, didn't didn't quite make the whole packet. Yeah, so that's the Ubertooth. We'll stop that now. No need to 
scan all of your devices. Oh, so that actually wasn't scanning. It wasn't sending out any scan requests. It was just listening. Uh, there, there is quite a difference because you can once you scan, your device can actually respond with more information. There's like a scan response that it can do. Cool. So. <clears throat> How are we going for time? Hmm? Three minutes. All right. Just enough time to show you my Internet of Things wonderful application. Uh, occupied. <laughs> uh, when <laughs> is the toilet occupied? Uh, how long has it been occupied for? And when can I occupy the toilet? These are the questions I want to know every day. <laughs> <laughs> Why not make an Internet of Things device to help me with this? So here's my little MetaWare device, and I want to put it on the little locking mechanism of the toilets at my work. I guess. <laughs> uh, maybe if I cover it up with something, people won't really get suspicious. Um, so how does this thing work? Uh, there's an accelerometer on this, which has x, y, z, and that means that it's measuring the, the acceleration in, in time and space. Uh, so what, we, what kind of forces have we got going on right now? We've got gravity, which is downwards, uh, and sort of we're all experiencing gravity, but in a, in a weird way, because there's the seat that you're sitting on, which is supporting you from hitting the center of the Earth. So when you sort of sit down, if you sort of close your eyes and imagine what do you feel in the room, it would probably be the chair, you know, pushing up on your bottom. Uh, so that's actually, it, fr from your point of view, there's a force going upwards, you know, keeping you where you are. Um, and really, if you did have, a, if you tied like this little guy to a piece of string and had a rocket that went up at 9.8 meters one second squared, it would sort of stay stationary. You know, like if you imagine this sort of just, just hovering, like a quadcopter, if you will, as well, you know, it's, it's got a force going upwards, but it's not actually moving downwards. So we can measure this and use it for occupied. Um, <coughs> if you imagine, here's, how many, here's, here's the uh, device, and when I start rotating the device, um, I still have my uh, gravity going up, but the measured gravity going down is, uh, on the actual device, sort of like changes around. So if I were to measure that, and um, it's just, you'll, you'll see. I'm going to do the quickest demo of this guy. Um, you'll, want to, you'll want to toilet, <laughs> toilet humor. Uh, so this acceleration file is basically going to connect using the Python API that they've provided and print out some acceleration data. So let's run that. Ooh, I need to enter the address. Uh, Ooh. Okay, so we'll just grab the address. So, all right, you can see acceleration values. So, basically, this is now measuring the acceleration, and so the final demo. In case you have lots of toilets, by the way, that's what you need, you know, you just need to know. Oh, C9's ready. Oh, cool. Oh, come on, you've got to work. It's like, peace. Okay, here we are. So, we're occupied. And then, if we rotate around... Available! <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm done. Fortunately, we will not have time for questions, but I'm sure Jeremy will be happy to answer your questions in the hallway or somewhere else. Um, catch, him up, catch him around. <laughs> <laughs> don't accost him in the toilet. Please don't. Um, and, yeah, big round of applause for Jeremy and his wonderful demonstration.